Joyce Klotz has put together a fantastic program for you today. Uh, we've got uh, several board members here. Uh, we've got Ron Coda, and we've got Peg Joyce, and we've got Dave Fleming, and who else have we got? We are the historical society, so we're kind of historical, and a lot of us don't get up until about two. Art, art, yeah, art is here. Oh, Oglesbury, here he is. And uh, I think we're just going to get going, huh, Joyce? You want to introduce the mayor? The mayor, the mayor here. Where's the mayor? Oh, oh there she is. There she is. Mayor Val Johnson is here, and. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, help uh, with uh, the goodies. We want to talk, uh, thank all of the uh, board members and uh, spouses and, and uh, everybody that has brought the goodies. So we've got a lot of uh, sweets laying around other than me. Joyce, go ahead. I'm Joyce Klons. I am a uh, member of the Historical Society and have been on the board since 1980. We have, are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, and I'd like to point out some things over at the far table by the window over here. We have our books that we have printed. Uh, had to print the new green book again because that, that sold out. That is the chronological history of New Brighton, written by Gene Skiba back in 1987, which was the centennial year. And then there are two other books, A Pictorial History of New Brighton from the 1880s to the 1950s, and then from the 1950s to the present. Those are books that I did of photographs. And then the last one, Wayne is holding those up over there, is a paper-bound book called Historical Snippets. And what's in that book is I gleaned all of the New Brighton Bulletin history capsules that Gene Skiba had written over the years. And usually there was one in there every single week. And it's a, it's a, a tribute to Gene for the historical knowledge that he gave us for so many years. We also have some membership blanks over on that table, and we have a couple of tools from the ice harvesting on Long Lake. So um, we would encourage you to become a member of the Historical Society. It's a very membership blanks over there and, and a place for you to sign up if you want more information. So we thank you for coming. So, first I want to talk to you a little bit about ice castles. How many of you have been up to see the ice castles in Long Lake Park? Well, it will, it will, it will remain for quite a bit of time, as you remember, I think it was last Sunday when we reached 40 some degrees and they did close down that day, but they reopened and they're going to be running as long as the weather is good. So it's an award-winning frozen attraction located in six different cities across North America. The experience is built using hundreds of thousands of icicles hand-placed by professional ice harvest. The castles include breathtaking LED-lit sculptures, frozen thrones, ice-carved tunnels, slides, fountains, and much more. And there's a picture of, of a girl coming out of one of the tunnels last year. The history of ice castles in Minnesota. Ice castles first came to the state in 2012 to 13 at the Mall of America. Eden Prairie hosted the event in 2016. Stillwater hosted twice in 2017 and 2018. And Excelsior hosted in 2019. And Ice Castles announced its decision to locate in New Brighton on November 1st, 2019, and construction started soon afterwards. So the following pages are going to show the Ice Castles in production. On December 18th, this is how it looked, and it was all fenced in. And you can see in the background that the Ice Castles are starting. 
And here are some more pictures taken by Art, probably December as well, Art? Okay. And some more photos as well. Now we had hoped to have somebody from Ice Castles tell us a little bit about how, how, how this production takes place, but their publicity person is in Utah today, unfortunately. So we're just going to wing it here and hope we can figure out how they do it. Well, since 2011, Ice Castles has been dedicated to creating an experience that will live on long after the ice melts. Founder Brett Christensen crafted his first icy creation in the front yard of his home to bring happiness and joy to his children. After moving from sunny California to snowy Utah, Christensen did what any father of six stir-crazy kids would do. He built an ice castle in his yard. And his icy invention wasn't just a hit with his own children. Kids from all over the neighborhood got wind of his creation, bundled up, and headed outside to play at his wintry wonderland. The kids affectionately called this winter wonderland an ice castle. An ice castle's mission is to create happiness, laughter, and unforgettable winter memories. And ice castles has grown significantly since then, spreading to six states. So you can see that they're in Colorado, Alberta, Minnesota, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, and Utah. Um, he started this out by spraying his mixture of water around his kid's swing set. So he had a foundation to start this. And from there, he hired people who do this professionally and came up with the idea of ice castles. You can buy tickets online. Just go to your internet and put in icecastles.com slash Minnesota. And the ticket prices are listed there for your, for, for your uh, convenience. Uh, notice that they also have some standby tickets, but they are not guaranteed because if it's a big crowd, you may not get in. So this is, this is, I feel, an appropriate price for what you're getting out of it because the, especially for children, they have the ability to go in and slide and, and uh, somebody's grandchild was there the other day and really felt it was wonderful, right? Well, building objects out of snow is not new to Minnesota. We do this all the time. Here's a little bit more information about ice palaces in Minnesota. The St. Paul Winter Carnival produced many ice palaces over the years, beginning in 1886. The following information I'm going to show you was featured in a Star Tribune article on August 8, 2017. So I'm crediting the Star Tribune, the St. Paul Winter Carnival, and the Minnesota Historical Society for allowing us to show you these very old photographs. So pictured here in 1886, the first ice palace in the United States was built for the first St. Paul Winter Carnival. It was 106 feet tall, made with 20,000 blocks of ice, and lit from the inside by electric lights. Just think about this, 1886, <laughs> and they had the wherewithal to come up with this. Here is the 1887 St. Paul Winter Carnival Palace from a drawing that, that um, was donated to the Winter Carnival. Here is the 1887 St. Paul Winter Carnival Palace again. Here is the 1888 St. Paul Winter Carnival Palace. So they did it three or four years in a row there. And then we jump to the next photo is 1936 and 1940 and 1976. And you may remember the one in 1992 this is a great photo of it right there on the river. 
And here's the 2004 Winter Carnival Palace. And the last one they had was in 2018. And this is a drawing done by a friend of mine, husband of the Winter Car Carnival pa Palace in 2018. Well, as ice castles come, came to Long Lake Regional Park, many of you may not know that the harvesting of ice on Long Lake stems from 1888 and continued until the 1950s. There were at least four ice house companies operating on Long Lake in New Brighton. All of this came about at the turn of the century in the late 1880s and early 1890s. The village of New Brighton was changed forever when the stockyards and meatpacking industries came to our area, precipitating the need for ice for commercial businesses and residential use. This was all done before electric refrigeration became common to our area. Let's look at how ice harvesting was done on New Brighton's Long Lake, but first we need to look, take a look at the stockyards industry which made all of this happen in the 1890s. The massive stockyards and packing plants were built in New Brighton in 1889. Two large packing houses, Twin City Packing Company and the Minneapolis Stockyards and Packing Company, were formed and located immediately south of the stockyards. If it's a packing company, obviously they need ice to preserve the meat. Take a look at this picture here very carefully because the next picture shows stockyard days using that same photo as their logo back in 1981. Do you see the similarity between the two? They took our Historical Society photo and had somebody sketch their logo, which they used for many years, as their letterhead. Well, Stockyard Days celebrates New Brighton's colorful history, and here are some buttons that I've found online or that I had in my own possession of stockyard days. Up at our um, New Brighton History Center, we have every stockyard days button uh, featured in, in a display from 1981, I believe it was, all the way to the present. Well, the stockyards was a million dollar operation at the turn of the century. Many prominent Twin City investors were involved as directors and officers of the stockyards, including J.S. Pillsbury, you'll recognize a lot of these names, W.H. Dunwoody, H.E. Fletcher, Thomas Lowry, who was the father of the transit system in Minneapolis, R.R. Langdon, W.H. Eustace, W.D. Washburn, Washburn is from the Milling family, family. A.J. Bletham, J.H. Randall, W.S. King, George Brackett, Jar Charles Fairchild, S.C. Gale, A.H. Linton, C.J. Alloway, A.C. Libby, and Gasberg Farrer. Those are the people whose names were given on the documents for the investment in the stockyards. The stockyards could accommodate 5,000 cattle, 10,000 hogs, 20,000 sheep, and 500 horses on its 30 acres. I don't think a lot of us re really realize that there were 20,000 sheep that were at that. That surprised me. So this particular slide is a line drawing from the Twin City Livestock Reporter which shows stockyard facilities including feed barns, horse barns, ice houses, a depot, a steam driver, a pump house, packing plants, and a roundhouse for the railroad. Now I'm going to see if I can tell you what all of these stand for. There are numbers on there that at the top that point to what they are. And these are the types of things that we're seeing on that picture. The stock exchange, a water tank, slaughterhouses, an ice house, Twin City Hide and Tallow, Majerus Brothers Slaughter and Windering Works, a feed barn, horse barn, Twin City Packing Plant, Minneapolis Packing, and then downtown area, these were the businesses that went on 
Charles Anderson the barber, La Ponchadier the druggist and postmaster, the Transit House Hotel, Miss, or Hires Dry Goods, Notions Confectionery, Joe Fox Boot and Shoe Store, Searles Block, and Wayne is from that family, Moore and Divine Boarding House, Miriam Lumber, Lumber Yard, Brighton Hotel, which was Jacob Byswinger, um, Fraser Livery and Boarding Stable, Martin Block, Ice Houses, Roundhouse Salt, excuse me, Roundhouse Beltline Railway and the Depot. Now let's get back to that and you can see off to the right is the downtown area. We are looking east on this picture. Is that right? Is it east? Yes. Yeah. And you can see the, the huge array of the stockyards on the end of town. And right in the middle is the Exchange Hotel, which eventually became by Swinger's Hardware Store. We have copies of these of this drawing of, uh, for sale up at the depot if you would like to purchase it this summer when we're open. Here's a picture of, of the stockyards and the picture of the newspaper, the Twin City Livestock Reporter. That was the only paper in the area at the time and the majority of the paper has um, ads for the stockyards in it. A little tiny section of local news. And back when my sister and I pr helped produce the, the Centennial Play, we scoured that local news and got all the gossip from that local news and we built our play around all of the gossip from the Twin City Livestock Reporter and from Jean's potential book as well. So here's an ad for the stockyards. It was, it was printed in the Twin City Livestock Reporter in 1892. It's clear there was a need for ice houses for shipping. And the Boston Ice Company was formed for this reason. This was the main one at, that took care of the, the packing houses that were there. We know very little about the Boston Ice Company but its chief output of ice was to the packing houses for refrigerated railway cars. And one of the firm's large houses on the lake shore and west of the packing houses served for over 20 years as an arresting landmark until it had to be removed following severe storm damage. And we have no photos of the Boston Ice Company. Much of this information, by the way, has been gleaned from Jean Skiba's book, A Centennial History of New Brighton. Other industries sprang up as a direct result of the stockyards. This included hotels for cowboys coming in on trains, construction of new homes for stockyard workers, an ironworks factory, brickyards, saloons, grocery stores, livery stables, etc. Now this picture is of the exchange building, and this is hard for me to read, so the classic photo shows mounted cattlemen posing in front of the opulent exchange hotel in the 1890s. Built to accommodate 150 guests, the hotel first called the Cattlemen's Hotel was constructed at a price of $30,000. This building housed a hotel, dining room, bank, land company, railroad offices, stock, commission offices, telegraph office, newspaper presses, barbershop, saloon, and gamings, gaming rooms. It eventually became a canning factory and finally Swingers Hardware. The building was raised in October of 1988. This is hard to read. Undue influences by the railroad and sanitation problems forced the packing industry operation to close. After the packing industry left the New Brighton area in 1901, the pens were used for many years for feeding and watering livestock before they were shipped to Chicago, Illinois, or Sioux City. So those pens 
stockyard pens, which many of you as children may have walked up and seen. Those pens were used for many, many years after the stockyards themselves uh, left. So many industries remained after the closing of the stockyards, including rendering plants, hotels, a lumber yard, the ice house industry, which provided ice commercially and to residents. So now we get to ice harvesting. Ice harvesting continued to be a huge New Brighton business on Long Lake due to its pristine waters. Long Lake had a reputation metro-wide for its clean quality. So this continued for many, many years. Other ice houses on Long Lake were built during the same time frame. J.C. James Ice House and F.C. Boardman's Ice House were two of them. We have no information about these two ice houses. But People's Coal and Ice Company, we do. In 1888, this company built a very large ice house covering two-thirds of an acre on Long Lake. The People's Coal and Ice Company was located on the east side of Long Lake adjacent to the massive stockyards and packing houses. You'll see it as the five in the back, or right on the lakeside, that five-pointed building is People's Coal and Ice. And here is the, another picture from the lakeside of People's Coal and Ice. People's Coal and Ice Company provided ice for commercial and residential use. It was one of New Brighton's earliest business enterprises, which began in 1888. So how was ice harvested? They actually say ice harvesting when we're talking about taking ice out of there. And just this past weekend, Richardson Nature Center had an uh, ice harvesting opening or place for families to come and try to cut ice and it was, I don't know if you saw it in the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, but it, it had a big article in it a, a few days ago about it. So it, they're, they're demonstrating how it was done before. When ice was about 10 inches thick, the snow was removed with teams of horses pulling scrapers. Here's one horse and a sweep operated the conveyor which carried the ice up to a platform from which it is loaded on sleighs. The 20 by 32 inch blocks were cut with an ice plow and horsepower and then taken up the conveyor to the ice houses. A familiar name to New Brighton, Paul Zamor, was a foreman of this ice making facility. Up to 8,000 carloads of ice were hauled from people's coal and ice each year. Divide that by 365 days and you can see how many went out daily. Loading facilities allowed 16 railway cars to be loaded at the same time at the huge ice house. The business was to continue until the 1950s. Here is the conveyor system to the ice house. It was massive, made of wood, and another view of the massive conveyor system. How many of you out there remember seeing this? There he is. I worked here in 1952. You said they shut down. We're going to come and talk to you in a bit. <laughs> Here's ice making with Hank Bona, another familiar New Brighton name. Now here is the Minnesota State Gazetteer and Business Directory from 1900 to 1901, volume 12, page 90, which shows William Devine as a proprietor of the Brighton Hotel and Saloon, who later became manager of People's Ice and Coal Company. There's no listing for that company in 1900, though. But here is the Minnesota State Gazetteer and Business Directory from 1926-27, volume 24 on page 698, and it shows the People's Coal and Ice Company listed with William D. Devine as manager. And on that same page, here's a close-up of the previous 1926 Gazetteer listing showing People's Coal and Ice Company. You'll recognize some, some uh, Familiar names on there, Charles Nixon, who was the agent at the Sioux Line Depot, 
People's Coal and Ice, Schmalzbauer General Store, uh, Slim Key, who was a barber, Ben Hoven Company, was the, uh, Joseph Lachik was the manager of Rendering Works, Frank Zemur, and then the one in bold print, he must have paid more to get it in bold print on that, Frank Searles for the lumber company. People's Ice Company fire date undetermined. As refrigerators became popular, ice harvesting was no longer a big business on Long Lake. We don't know when this happened. We have no record of that. Here are tools used for ice harvesting, and they're on the table over there, Wayne, if you would hold them up. Okay, take a look back over there. Those are ice tongs. They were donated by Leroy Erlinson in 2008, and they are hanging on the wall in the New Brighton History Center freight room located in Long Lake Park. Imagine trying to grab ice. How many, <laughs> how many could you do? <laughs> You'd have to be pretty strong. Okay, I'm coming to that next. Some of these donated tools hanging on the wall of the freight room may also be tools for ice harvesting. What do you think? Do you think anything else up there is from ice harvesting? Well, they used a saw, we know that. That could have been. That whole wall is full of tools that were donated to us, some of which we don't know what they were used for. So here is a push pole that Wayne has in his hands. This was used for ice harvesting and it was actually found at the bottom of Long Lake in 2005 and was donated to the society by Ken Ellis and John Herzig. We have it mounted in the freight room, but we took it off for today to show you. It's, it's pretty, uh, the wood is, is deteriorated quite a bit, but we have to believe it's, it's from the ice industry, because where, why else would it be there? They never did tell us where exactly they found it, but it's a, a beautiful antique that we're very, very proud of. So let's just talk a little bit about refrigeration because that's what we used ice for back then. The first cooling systems for food in, uh, involved ice, obviously. Artificial refrigeration actually began in the mid-1750s and developed in the early 1800s. And in 1854, the first commercial ice making machine was invented. In October of last year, Denny Warwick donated this vintage ice box to the society. It was made by bone and was built for residential use. You recognize this? Any of these type of refrigerators? And here's how it looks in the center. There wasn't much storage space because most of the storage was for ice big chunks of ice, and, and would you think that the, the long one would be for ice or the two shorter ones, for those of you that have past experience? Which, do, what did you think? Shorter ones? Okay, so this ad came from the New York Tribune in 1910. Bone refrigerators, which were really ice boxes, had been in use for years on dining and refrigerator cars of the railroad system. But then they became available for the public to use. These are, again, bone siphon refrigerators. And you'll see that they are, they are the same type that was donated to us. Just a little history about refrigeration. In 1913, the first electric refrigerator for home use was invented by American Fred W. Wolf and was called the Domery or the Dom E electric refrigerator and was mounted on top of an ice box. In 1923, Frigidaire introduced the first self-contained unit and the introduction of Freon in the 1920s expanded the refrigerator market during the 1930s 
and home freezers as separate compartments were introduced in 1940. Electric refrigeration made the harvesting of ice a declining industry. Instead of harvesting ice, Long Lake became a fishing and boating mecca for fishermen. And for many years, the New Brighton Sportsman's Club held yearly ice fishing contest on Long Lake. Love this photo. We don't have a year on it, unfortunately, but you can see all of the cars surrounding all of the people on the lake. Much of this information is available in the New Brighton Area Historical Society's hardcover history books written in 1987, 2002, and 2005. Our green book has just been reprinted as it had sold out, and we have these books to, to here today for your purchase. And our fourth book, Historical Snippets, contains New Brighton Bulletin articles written by editor emeritus Jane Skiba. Just a little bit about us. Our society was formed in 1980. The New Brighton History Center, a renovated Sioux Line Depot in Long Lake Park, was dedicated in 1995 after many years of renovation. That building sat on the south end of town and was built in 1887, so by far the oldest remaining building left in New Brighton. The society is an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization and any contributions that you provide to the society go directly to the operation of the History Center and its exhibits. And we have a little basket to pass around, and if you, if you feel to choose to donate to us, we hope you will do that. Or we have the jar over on the end there. Do you have the basket? Okay. And we encourage you to become a member. Membership applications are available at the desk, and here's more information. The New Brighton Area Historical Society preserves our history and operates the New Brighton History Center. Your membership supports our all-volunteer organization and allows us to showcase our history and honor our heritage for years to come. So help us preserve and share the fascinating history of the New Brighton Area by becoming a member. Single memberships are only $10 a year, family are $15, and business and club are $100. We appreciate your support, and because we are all volunteer, everything goes directly into the operation of the Historical Society. And we also have a website, newbrightonhistory.com is all that you need to know to go in, and we have lots of photographs, lots of history, lots of interesting things about our history. Any questions or comments, that ends our program formal program, and I have a microphone here if anybody wants to say anything. I particularly would like to hear from Ed Rowan. Yeah, tell him about your ice harvesting. Well, that's, that's a tool I use right there. Pocket hit. <laughs> I use that tool there that Donnie's got. Okay. I was, I was getting nice. Yeah. How many years did you work for that? I just, I was home from the Army on furlough. Furlough only lasted two, three weeks. Oh, okay. So while I was there, I screwed up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I appreciate getting fired. So. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Anybody else have any questions? I saw other local people, Bob Miller. And Okay, he said. Bob, Bob Miller and Bob Covey. Okay, and and we we cert we certainly saw the uh, the Zomer family and the Bona family. Those are old time Brighton families as well. So, do you, anybody have any questions about ice? Everything about ice. <laughs> Say that again. In those refrigerators that took the ice like that, you had to get rid of the water when the ice melted. And how did they do that? Well, you would carry it out. You carry it out. Okay. Well, how you did it, I wasn't there. The uh, 
the refrigerator that, uh, or the, or the uh, ice chest that we've got in the uh, depot, the new one, it had three compartments. And the top right compartment is where the ice went. And then there was a drain that went into the bottom. So that was probably, well, and then that went below to another tray. So uh, that was probably the coldest part. That's where they kept the ice cream. Uh, and then the other, the, the bigger part was for the uh, things that didn't need quite that much refrigeration. But it's really a neat, a neat ice box. And that one that, that we got from Bison, that, that's got to be one of the first ones. It's got the condenser on top. So basically an ice box with a condenser on the top. So that must be, that must be one of the first ones. I think it's the refrigerator. I, you know, we're, this is all made possible by the uh, New Brighton Historical Society and the city of New Brighton has given us the room. So uh, we really appreciate that. And, uh, yes? And then the entrance fee to the castle, for the castle, or is it New Brighton paying for that? That's a private industry, or private enterprise. They're independent, right? Yeah. We're not getting any money from that, are we, Mayor? Well, a little bit. We are. Yeah, you're selling them water. Uh, you're selling them water. So, can anybody guess how many gallons of water? I, okay, I hear millions over here. Anybody want to make a guess? Gallons of water. 30 million gallons of water. Oh. So it's a t it's a lot of water. But um, they are renting the park from Ramsey County. So Ramsey County actually arranged for them to be there. So they rent the park from Ramsey County. We put meters on the fire hydrants up there, so that's how we know how much water they're using. And they're paying a commercial rate for the water, so we will be making a little bit of money off of that. Um, but our businesses are making... Um, money from that also our restaurant tours in town we got them all together they uh, put together some special guides and uh, business is booming at some of our restaurants so we're happy to have the ice castles here in town are they still running the shuttles yeah there are shuttles running on um friday saturday and sunday from adagio's over in the north side of town and then uh the exchange has a shuttle also the shuttles are free so please take advantage of those. Hi, my name is Chuck. I, have real, I don't really need this. But um, <laughs> my father-in-law was Orb Krauss, for those of you that knew him. This is his jacket. My wife gives me crap for wearing it because it's old and tattered. But, but anyway, um, I drive seniors from Meadowood and Brighton Hill. And um, a question I have is, the, the way the ice castle is set up, I know it's crushed ice, and I know a lot of people that would like to see it, but it's not really set up for like a walker or wheelchair or somebody that had trouble walking to go in. Is that correct? I don't know that because yeah. your grandson who yeah. went, your grandson who went talked about the kind of floor that they had put in, and it was a combination of crushed ice and, <coughs> and snow. And snow. So it feels like you're walking on sand on a beach. But, no, I doubt a wheelchair. Yeah. Well, Some of the excesses right. are too small. Uh, maybe Val can answer that for us. So I, I think I can answer that for you. Um, you know, they, they make ice up there every single day. They, they make um, icicles, they plant them into the ice castle, and then water comes over the top of them and they expand. Well, that water also hits the ground. And most of this happens at night. So during, um, before they open up during the day, they go through the area w with a machine that's called a dingo. And the dingo breaks up that ice that's been formed during the night and turns it into almost what feels, feels like sand, but almost like walking in slush. And so it gets deeper, you know, as the season goes on, it gets deeper and deeper. It is really hard to walk through if you're not steady on your feet. 
Now they do say that they can accommodate you on a sled of some sort, and they do have, can make arrangements for that. But, um, you know, it is a tough thing to see from the inside if you're not able to walk. However, um, you know, you can drive by up there, and I would suggest doing that. Um, and then they've got some beautiful pictures on their website, but I think if you see it even from the outside, and you see that beautiful blue color during the day, and then at night when they have the um, lights that are actually inside of the ice, um, it's also a pretty sight. that we have. You know, um, I've learned from um, Wayne and other people on the Historical Society, one of the reasons the slaughterhouses are no longer here is because the council back in the day sort of closed down the, the uh, packing because it was such an unsanitary situation. So it threatened Long Lake back in the day. Um, and so the council again said, you know, we don't want this. And so it, the meat packing was one of the reasons it went away. Um, water, because of the fertilizer that we're using and because we're building right up to the lakes and uh, like the governor now has got a, um, oh, like at farms where you have to have, I think it's 30 feet before uh, a lake of unharvested ground so that the natural uh, filtration will happen. The water in New Brighton flows from St. Anthony, goes all the way through the city. In fact, this little creek right out here flows over to Long Lake. But this last year, uh, we opened up uh, Hanson Park. And that has a filtration system built into it. So the water that is coming from um, the sewer, not the sewers, the um, ground runoff. Yeah, we, not the sewer water. <laughs> the ground runoff. And if you think about Hanson Park, everything is, uh, everything is uphill from Hanson Park. It used to be a big swamp when I was a kid. And um, now it all goes into that uh, holding pond, and then it gets pumped into these sand filters. You may see what looks like sand bunkers on the north side of the park. The water gets pumped into there. It naturally filters out all the nitrates, and then from there it flows down into Pike Lake and from Pike Lake into Log Lake. So that was a $4 million project that was funded by the Rice Creek Watershed District. So it is going to help the uh, lakes um, over a period of time, and it will be better than it has been. But I doubt, I don't know, it'd be pretty tough to get back to the, the pristine waters of the 1890s, long before motorboats and everything else were on the lakes. Did I answer your question? Okay. My, my one fan. I went to school with her. <laughs> but before her. Any other questions? Hey Wayne, do you know, does it have some springs that come into the lake that you can get clear water from springs versus runoff? I thought they had there was one at least a uh, spring in the lake. Well, oh, I think there, I think there are springs yeah. in the lake, but I think most of it comes in from uh, like Rice Creek, uh, well, from up where was Rice Lake, and runs down into uh, into Long Lake. There, there were there there are springs in the lake, 
I, I can't tell you where they are. And if I knew, I wouldn't tell you because it'd be good to <laughs> It'd be my secret. I remember once there was a, a newspaper article, a picture of a guy that pulled a 29-pound northern on a long leg. Maybe it was you, Ed, huh? 29 pounds. That's something you'd come up with. One time they, they had uh, we had the groundwater uh, treated. I don't know if any of you remember that. They, they treated the groundwater in, uh, or, or the, the, the soil the, the, in the lake because there was so much algae in there. And it seems to me it was a Swedish company that came in and uh, for a couple of years they treated that and got rid of the algae. It, yeah, talk about, talk about, talk about uh, dirty water. <laughs> When uh, I know when I worked on, on the farm up there, we'd, we'd come in from uh, from work for uh, for lunch, and and we'd uh, jump in the lake, and we'd have a hard time because the pads of algae were were so thick, we'd have to try and find a place to dive between. Not that that would make a difference because when you came up, you'd come up in the algae anyhow, and it would uh, it burn your eyes. But it was really, really ripe. And of course, you, you remember too that the people that built around there, back in there, there was no sewer system. So it was, a, a, you know, there's grain fields coming from the septic tanks, and it was all going downhill into the lake. And uh, things were different in those days. They, uh, well, look at the arsenal. Uh, how, you know, they polluted the groundwater and all. We had a lot of pollution back in then. And uh, it took a lot to clean it up, but uh, he did a nice job. It's really, really clean uh, now compared to where it was. Thank you, Mayor. But, uh, you did a great job. Yeah. You know, all the squads are down here, go to Town, a long way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from uh, uh, all the way from uh, Johanna, I think. All in the watershed. Just get a lot of carp out of the traps there. Bullheads too, yeah. There are a lot of rough fish, but uh, that was it. Was kind of neat. Any uh, anybody have any comments or recollections that they want to share? No. Well, now thank you for coming. And there, there's a lot, a lot of desserts up there and coffee. And uh, take a look at our displays over there, what we have. We, uh, we welcome uh, uh, memberships. Uh, you don't have to do anything. We ask for 10 bucks a year for a membership, but all you have to do is help us out a little bit. If you like what we're doing, we try and we have a mission to, you know, to uh, uh, identify and collect 